Beta Ciron became the first FDA approved disease modifying therapy for MS in 1993, and there's several other similar beta interferon preparations such as Avonex, Plegrity, and Rebif. And of course, we have better, stronger drugs, but beta interferon still have an excellent side effect profile with no significant weakening of the immune system or increase in the rate of infections. And I have patients who have been stable on them for decades. So let's take a closer look at what beta interferons are, the different preparations, how they work, the results in clinical trials, and of course, the side effect profile. I have some timestamps if you want to skip ahead and references below. Let's have some fun. So these are the different approved beta interferon formulations for multiple sclerosis. All of these medications are injections that you give yourself at home, and there's beta interferon 1A and 1B, and I'll explain the differences in just a moment. So beta seron and Extavia are identical formulations. The drug is exactly the same. They are interferon beta 1B formulations given subcutaneously under the skin every other day. Rebif is an interferon beta 1A formulation given subcutaneously three times weekly, so a little bit less often. Avonex is interferon beta 1A, the exact same drug as Rebif, given intramuscularly once weekly. And there's some evidence that Avonex is less effective than these other drugs, as I'll show a little bit later. And Plegrity is pegylated interferon, which is a slow-release formulation of interferon that's given only once every two weeks. Now, all of these medications can cause some side effects, some flu-like symptoms, muscle aches. And so there's actually a dose escalation that you can give starting at a lower dose just to make the drug more well tolerated. This is what beta interferons look like. It's a protein that has an alpha helix formulation and you can see it has a carbohydrate side chain as well. Now the interferons are actually engineered in a lab, but they're very similar to the human protein. So for interferon beta 1b, they're engineered from E. coli plasmids, which are little pieces of DNA and they're infected with a human gene for interferon beta. Obviously, bacteria don't have this gene. However, it's not exactly the same as the normal human protein because the N-terminal methionine has been deleted, so one of the amino acids is gone, and it has no carbohydrate side chain. The normal human interferon has a carbohydrate side chain. Beta interferon 1A is engineered using hamster ovary cells, which are transfected with the human interferon gene from fibroblasts. Avonex and Rebif are N-glycosylated. In other words, they have the sugar side chain, just like natural interferon. So you could say beta interferon 1A is more advanced, more human-like, although there does not seem to be a significant difference in efficacy or side effects between, say, Rebif, which is beta interferon 1A, and beta seron or Extavia. So what are the differences between the two? Well, as I said, beta interferon 1A is glycosylated, has the sugar side chain and the natural sequence of amino acids. There's some evidence that it has higher antiviral activity. Interestingly, there, these are proteins that are released naturally by the liver in response to viral infections, and they may have some antiviral properties. People with MS taking these drugs do not seem to have any significant increase in the risk of infection. In fact, there are observational reports showing that people with MS taking this drug may have a lower risk of getting COVID-19, although that may be due to differences in their behavior as well. And as I said, beta interferon 1B is not glycosylated. It does not have the sugar side chain. And the protein is more likely to aggregate. This is in in vitro studies, although this doesn't seem to decrease its effectiveness or safety. So how does it work? What is the mechanism of action? Well, as I said, interferons are proteins naturally created by the liver in response to viral infections. And so all interferon formulations, both 1A and 1B, bind to receptors in the cells called interferon type 1 receptors. Then there are many downstream effects, such as the upregulation of 2 prime, 5 prime, oligodenylate synthetase, and various other intermediate proteins, and it has complicated biological effects. The main mechanism of action with respect to multiple sclerosis seems to be that it shifts the immune profile from more of a 
T helper cell type 1 profile, which is associated with MS inflammation, to a T helper cell type 2 profile. These are different types of CD4 positive T cells. There are various other observed effects, such as increased intraleukin 10 in the cerebrospinal fluid. This has been associated with reduction in multiple sclerosis relapses, reduced antigen presentation, and reduced proliferation of T cells, and reduced metalloproteinase expression. This is a protein involved in cell and tissue destruction in inflammation, and it may restore suppressor T cell function. So there are certain T cells, such as those with the CD25 receptor, involved in regulating the immune system, which may be abnormal in MS. This is one such in vitro study looking at the percentage of suppressor T cells in people with and without beta interferons. And you can see those taking interferon beta seem to have an increase in suppressor T cells. What about the pharmacology of the drug? Well, the half-life of all interferon preparations is very, very short, only about 4.3 hours maximum. However, the biological activity is delayed, such as interleukin-10, and the decay is much shorter, perhaps around 48 to 72 hours. So for most interferon preparations, like beta-seron and rebif, where you're taking it every other day or three times a week, probably the effect in the body is fairly steady. But with something like Avonex, maybe the effect decays, and that may Maybe what's making this drug a little bit less effective, although you have the convenience of only having to take the shot once a week. Well, let's take a look at the actual results in clinical trials. You can see Rebif and beta seron, the so-called high-dose, high-frequency interferons, seem to be more effective, reducing relapses by around a third, 33 to 37%, whereas the Avonex studies, and this is a combination of both randomized controlled trials and open-label studies, you can see that it's definitely less effective. Now, 9.6% relapse reduction, 12.3% relapse reduction, it did do better this than this in the pivotal trials. So even the least effective formulation, Avonex, definitely beats placebo. This is one study looking at time to having a second relapse after the first relapse leading to diagnosis. And you can see people getting Avonex were much more delayed in getting their second relapse. This was easily statistically significant with a relative rate of 0.56. In other words, a 44% reduction in relapses. This is looking at disability progression, so worsening of disability based on the EDSS scale over time. And you can see over this period of 104 weeks, Avonex versus placebo, Avonex, people taking that drug, only 22% of them had disability progression versus 35% taking placebo. So even the least effective formulation seems to have some effect. Now, this is, of course, modest, and that's why we use these drugs less and less over time. We simply have more effective drugs, although it comes at a cost, specifically increased risk of weakening of the immune system and potentially causing more serious side effects. Now, what are the side effects of beta interferon? They're all very similar. So it's been reported these drugs could cause depression or even cause suicidal thoughts. People can get reactions at the injection site. Rarely people can have very severe reactions such as anaphylaxis, although that's quite rare. Now, it's very common for people to have flu-like symptoms. So you feel fatigued and achy or even have fever. So a lot of people take their shot in the evening so they can sort of sleep through some of the side effects. Some people will take an ibuprofen with food beforehand. And some people will even take steroids like prednisone 20 milligrams, particularly if they're taking Avonex or Plegrity where they have only have to take it maybe once per week. You don't want to be taking a lot of steroids long term. The other effect is that the immune system that you have can react to the drug and cause what are known as neutralizing antibodies or NABs, and this can decrease the effectiveness of the drug. More on that a little bit later. These drugs can cause muscle spasms, and rarely they can cause more serious problems like elevation of the liver function test or changes in the complete blood count, such as low white blood cells or even changes in thyroid hormone. There are also some very rare side effects that really aren't major, may not even be related to the drug, could be coincidental, but there are various case reports, so I'll mention them a little bit later. So depression and suicide, just to give some examples of some of these side effects, there was a meta-analysis on three beta seron randomized control trials, and there were three suicides and eight suicide attempts out of 1,240 treated patients, compared to one suicide and four suicide attempts in 789 people receiving placebo. So that does seem to be a difference there. And it's reported that it doesn't necessarily cause depression, but if you have depression, it could worsen the symptoms. So I usually don't recommend these medications to people who have poorly controlled depression. If you have a history of depression, but it's controlled, it's usually not a big deal. 
Now, injection site reactions are usually quite mild, a little bit of redness at the area of injection. They occur more with subcutaneous injections than with intramuscular injections, but rarely people can get necrosis or damage to the fat, and occasionally that can actually extend all the way to the muscle, and it can even cause scarring or rarely serious infections that have to be drained. So it's important to have clean technique. Now, a lot of these injections, they have auto injectors just to make it easy, so you just clean the skin and push a button and inject into the desired area, either the muscle or the subcutaneous fat, depending on the exact formulation. Allergies and anaphylaxis, they're very rare case reports. I've never seen a single case of a severe reaction in my entire career to these medications, but they do occur. People could get shortness of breath, uh, asthma attacks, angioedema, swelling of the lips and tongue and throat, rash, or hives. Again, not super common. So it is recommended to do blood testing for taking these drugs, usually a baseline liver function test and complete blood count and sometimes thyroid test, and then to check it again a little bit later and then periodically. All of these problems occur almost universally soon after starting the medication. It's sort of an idiosyncratic thing, so you don't necessarily have to keep monitoring for the rest of your life, although I personally do recommend checking them periodically in people taking these medications. So sometimes you could get low white blood cells, so low neutrophils, which is a type of white blood cell occurring in about 14%, low overall white blood cell count in about 14%. These are liver function tests, ALT and AST. And a lot of the times drugs increase liver function tests just a little bit, but it's not a big deal. But they have been reported to increase up to five times the baseline level in 10% for ALT and in 5% for AST. These studies are for the drug beta seron. It may be a little bit less for Avonex. So what about NAVs or neutralizing antibodies? Now, we don't really routinely test those. I personally wouldn't really recommend checking NAVs. If the drug didn't work, I would suggest just changing to a stronger medication. So if I had a patient that had new MRI lesions or relapse, I would just suggest changing to a stronger medication. However, it is possible to do laboratory tests for NAVs. They've been shown to reduce the biological activity of the drug along with the actual clinical efficacy. Although interestingly, they also reduce the risk of side effect because presumably they prevent the drug from binding to those beta interferon receptors. There seems to be a higher risk for subcutaneous formulations versus intramuscular form formulations and a higher risk with 1B, beta interferon 1B versus 1A. For example, Extavia and beta serone, which are the same drug, the rate is reported to be 28 to 47 percent, so pretty frequently. With Rebif, it's lower, 5 to 28 percent, depending on the exact study. With Avonex, 2 to 6% or roughly 5% risk at one year, so much lower risk with Avonex, although the drug is less effective overall. You can also get other binding antibodies that do not neutralize or reduce the efficacy of the drug. These are sometimes known as BABs, and in my opinion, they are insignificant. So what about some other side effects? So muscle spasticity has been reported in a pooled meta-analysis from multiple trials. The rate of spasticity is higher in people with MS being treated with beta interferons, about 40% versus only 33% with placebo. And we'll talk about some rare complications. A lot of these may be coincidental. If you want the citation, please ask me. I may not be able to fit everything. If you want the specific citation, I'm happy to send it to you. For example, anaplastic oligodendroglioma, a type of brain cancer, gliomatosis, another type of brain cancer, both with beta seron. There have been reports of meningiomas, again, a type of brain cancer. There's a report with beta seron of something called capillary leak syndrome with swelling and ascites or swelling of the aneurysm or pleural effusion and swelling in the lungs. But this was someone who had some other conditions, including uh, MGUS and, you know, a complement deficiency. So it was kind of a, a rare thing in someone with a specific condition. There have been reports of other autoimmune diseases, such as psoriatic arthritis with Avenue or celiac disease. Again, I don't really know if it's coincidental. People can have multiple diseases. There's been a report of exacerbation of trigeminal neuralgia in someone who already had the condition. There are rare reports of kidney disease. For instance, on the with Rebif, specifically Rebif for some reason, this actually a, appears on the package insert, there are four cases of thrombotic microangiopathy with severe high blood pressure and a condition called hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and I have a picture showing the biopsy of the kidney. 
And uh, this has been reported with interferon alpha in the past. It may be related to complement activation, and there have been rare other kidney disease reported. Again, I don't know for sure that they're related to the drug, but just so that you're aware of the possibility, these drugs, even though they're regarded as being generally extremely safe, there may be rare serious side effects. This is a biopsy showing thrombotic microangiopathy, a biopsy of the kidney, and someone taking Rebif. There are also rare skin changes, such as hypopigmentation, halo nevi, and also levito reticularis, as you can see in this individual's leg. So that's basically all the side effects. What about pregnancy? I would suggest you talk to your own provider if you're considering getting pregnant on any drug, of course. Uh, the old pregnancy guidelines suggested that this was a category C drug, meaning it's not really known if it's safe in pregnancy or not. Generally speaking, people who are pregnant with MS have a lower risk of new MRI lesions and relapse. So often we don't recommend any disease modifying therapy during pregnancy. Studies in both bacteria and in human lymphocytes show these drugs don't really cause mutations, so they're kind of unlikely to cause birth defects. Studies in animals such as rhesus monkeys show even at very high doses, much higher levels than used in human treatment of MS, they're really not teratogenic. In other words, they don't seem to cause birth defects. However, there are some reports of spontaneous abortions or miscarriages with this drug. One of the pivotal trials, in other words, one of the clinical trials leading to approval, there were four spontaneous abortions. Of course, miscarriages are quite common in general. There are a ton of pregnancy registries for all of these drugs. This is just one example. In a beta seron registry published in 2014, they had 95 pregnancies, 11.1% miscarriages or spontaneous abortions. The background rate is actually around 20%. So this was actually lower than the background rate. 2% stillbirths, and then there were 5 or 5.1% 5 with birth defects, trisomy 21, with his, which is Down syndrome. This is simply genetic and not related to the drug. Hemangioma, which is a skin lesion, and uh, one child who had hip dysplasia and heart defects, including patent foramen ovale, patent ductus arteriosus, and a ventricular septal defect. And there were other cases of craniosynostosis and polydactyly, which are skeletal deformities. However, these birth defects are relatively common in the general population, and there was no specific pattern. So it wasn't thought to be clear that this drug cause these birth defects. Although, again, we try to be extremely conservative. Definitely talk to your own provider. Some people will recommend stopping the medication if you intend to become pregnant. In terms of monitoring, it's recommended to have baseline blood counts, a complete blood count and liver function tests, and to repeat them about six to eight weeks afterwards, and then every six months for a period. But like I said, these abnormalities almost always occur up front. They usually don't occur years later, so you're kind of in the clear if they haven't happened after a little bit. And it's reasonable to check the thyroid, particularly if there are symptoms such as severe fatigue or other symptoms of thyroid disease. Some doctors would recommend checking uh, neutralizing antibiotics antibodies in certain situations, like if someone has a relapse or new lesion. As I said, my personal opinion is that it doesn't really matter. Probably better to just take a better medication if the drug is not working. Anyways, if you have any questions, please post in the comments below and definitely take a look at some of the references and please give suggestions for future videos.